So hi, everybody. Thanks for joining another episode of the Moip Show. Money over IP, for those of you who are new. And uh, uh, Kathleen is not someone who needs introduction. She's been in the crypto community for many years. Uh, uh, she spearheaded a bunch of new innovation, both on the kind of breaking new grounds on the legal side, laws that help us uh, protect our assets, help us with uh, creating banks that are crypto friendly and a lot of other stuff that I'm going to let her present. And thanks for tuning in and uh, thanks for joining the Moip Show. Thanks, Alex. So you, you're, uh, are you in Wyoming right now? Where are Because I saw you in Miami just two days ago. So three days ago. So <laughs> where yeah, are you? That that was my first uh, first foray out of this area since a year ago, February. Uh, yeah, that was that was kind of that was crazy. <laughs> it was a fun conference. Uh, boy, it's a different crowd than the usual crowd of, of the Bitcoin conferences and quite a bit, quite a few more people. Yeah, I think a lot of people were in a lockdown for like two years. And this was yeah. the first event for many of us. And they yep. were be, they were running like as if this will they will never be allowed again out <laughs> again. They were like, we're gonna party, we gotta take advantage of every opportunity. Uh, but it was definitely a record. Uh, I think total in Miami was like thirty to forty thousand. The show was maybe fifteen thousand. It was uh, nuts. Yeah, all time record. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. So maybe give us a little bit of a background, like uh, how did you get into crypto? Why did you decide to focus on it? and uh, tell us about your bank and, and the things that you're doing that will keep you busy every day. Uh, well, uh, everything, any, any and everything Bitcoin. Um, uh, and uh, I got into um, Bitcoin in, I first came across it in 2012, started uh, reading about it through alternative economic circles, didn't start buying it until 2013, really rolled up sleeves then. Um, and uh, and then got goxed. <laughs> so I learned some very important uh, lessons, paid some cheap tuition is, is how I think about it, uh, about uh, own your own coins and um, what intermediaries mean in this industry and counterparty risk. Uh, and uh, but just stuck with it, uh, even though I had losses. Uh, so there are some folks out there who are probably recent buyers who are sitting with losses. I had losses for more than a year on, on, on my Bitcoin back then. It can happen. Um, but uh, we've never broken a bull market in, in Bitcoin, if you look at it over the sustained trend. Um, and even despite, uh, you know, the big drawdown that we've had recently, um, the bull market trend long term is not broken. It's just the short term trend that's is clearly broken and uh and i stuck with it and it's paid off yeah celsius is the hodlers community right i mean we're uh we're all holding hands waiting for uh any winter to come uh, kind of uh pass and obviously anyone who was hodling over the last 12 years uh is ahead uh so definitely uh the right strategy when when you see all of this uh you know, all these new arrivals that are kind of joining crypto, what's your view, institutional, corporate, retail, like what's your view on this new wave of adoption that we've seen in the last few years? Well, first of all, it's interesting. I didn't realize Celsius is a hodler community. So uh, I just don't know that much about your community. So you and I haven't done uh, much together. So this is a chance to get to know each other here. But yes, hodling has definitely been uh, been the right approach. And um, uh, what, what I see happening is a broadening of adoption. Um, it, it happens in every four-year bull market cycle. There are distinct four-year cycles in Bitcoin, as you know, and the rest of the crypto industry does tend to um, follow in those, in those four-year cycles as well. And it's tied to the economics of, of the halvening. Bitcoin's inflation rate is cut in half every four years, and we are roughly now as scarce as gold, the stock to flow ratio is roughly the same as that of gold for Bitcoin. And in the next halvening, coming up in 2023, I believe, 2024, um, uh, there, uh, no, it's 2023, the, um, the, uh, the inflation rate of Bitcoin will be even, le uh, of course, cut in half again, and the stock to flow will, will be even more scarce than gold. And uh, ultimately, it's the scarcity of the asset that drives the value and uh, the sustainability. I, 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 I say a lot, and this is part of the reason why, Alex, you and I probably haven't crossed paths that much. I say a lot that the price of Bitcoin is, is the least important aspect, least interesting aspect of this. Well, it's, both, and I, 
it's supply and demand, right? So absolutely, and the technology supply. itself. Yeah. Right. Right. That's true, but but you know we we got to get it to a, a broad enough uh, adoption uh, to make make it applicable or useful for other uh, uh, you know uh, <clears throat> utilities as well. I think right now we kind of stuck in that uh, you know store value, right? Which again best performing assets and no one is complaining but but <laughs> my point is that if you want it to be formal payment you want it to be other things we got to get to a broad enough adoption which is also going to stabilize the price of bitcoin so it's kind of like a two in one so so when you see again we you, i mean we're we've we've been mostly retail i mean again we've had several mm -hmm. hundred million a hundred thousand customers join us uh, in the mm -hmm. last two years but recently we've seen a huge influx like thousands of corporates uh which kind of started in november of last year like overnight basically they all showed up and said yep we're opening a corporate account and we've seen institutions so we're about 350 institutions who are using us uh on a continuous basis so uh so that broadening is happening but the depth of the market like as far as overall distribution has not really happened yet right we still have like pretty high concentration uh, um, so when do you see that happening? Like what price levels or adoption do we need to get to, to kind of really see that much, much broader adoption? Well, I, I think that it's, it's going to be in the next cycle. Um, you know, the previous cycle built custody and exchanges to what they are today. Um, and that's the infrastructure that we needed in this, in this four year cycle. The next four year cycle is really, truly the, the, institutional infrastructure. It, it really doesn't exist yet. The big institutions like pension funds and endowments and foundations, those that are fiduciaries and have very high fiduciary standards. So they're more risk averse when it comes to picking counterparties. Uh, they're on the sidelines still. Yes, we've talked about institutions coming into crypto, but it's crypto dedicated funds or it's you know relatively small businesses um, not those that are, you know, big audited gap accounting or IFRS accounting uh, reporting firms. Those are still very far, very few and far between. Um, MicroStrategy, of course, is an outlier. We don't see a lot of those. We've seen a few, uh, but we don't see a lot of those. And those, those companies that have purchased Bitcoin for corporate treasury uh, because of the adverse accounting, which is one of the things that I think will get fixed in the next cycle, um, um, because of the adverse accounting, uh, most of them are not going above, uh, you know, two to five percent of their corporate cash. So it's still relatively small. What all this tells me is that people are preparing for the next bull market cycle. They're doing their work now. They're getting the infrastructure ready for the next bull cycle. All of all of the custody and consolidated reporting and um, post-trade analytics and reporting that needs need to get done plugged into the the custodians that handle other asset classes like securities and commodities right now our, our industry is pretty much um, standalone it's not integrated into the traditional financial system and all those things are going to happen in the next four years i think and that's the next um, piece of development. And so the infrastructure for the next bull market is just now getting built. And it's, uh, it's, it's infrastructure, I think, in the US that's going to be very, and in, de in the developed world generally, that's going to be very integrated with fiat money and potentially fiat uh, securities settlement systems. Um, and then you see what's happening in the developing world. Um, obviously, we're, re we're recording this right after the Ecuador news um, from last night. I happened to be on Nick's um, Twitter spaces and on stage when he, uh, with the, the, the president of El Salvador's brother came on and then Nick said, hey, can you get the president to come on? And then it, we just watched the, as the uh, number of participants in that um, online event just exploded. And you saw Jack Dorsey come in, you saw Mark Cuban come in, some of the famous names, and, uh, and uh, they were all listening. And a few of us were on the stage at that point and, and got to ask the president questions. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little cautious about the news there because um, the, the devil's going to be in the details and the bill that passed in El Salvador last night is three pages. <laughs> so there aren't a lot of details, let's put it that way. But, um, but certainly directionally, 
you know, this is going to change the discussion uh, in the emerging markets. We've seen a lot of Latin American countries, um, prominent politicians signal that they're interested in following El Salvador's suit. And now some countries in Africa are starting to, to get on that train. Um, and they have a very good reason for wanting to do it, which is that the remittance market, which in most of these countries is a pretty sizable of GDP, uh, percentage of GDP, uh, the remittance market is really expensive. There are a lot of intermediaries who take fees. And uh, if we can, we collectively as a community can reduce those fees by moving money more efficiently, then um, even if the, all the existing uh, processes and infrastructures don't change, which I believe they will, but even if they don't, then it's an increase in GDP that, is, that accrues to the folks in the developing world. So that's what El Salvador is playing for. The devil's going to be in the details, but obviously it's got the community pretty excited today. Yeah, no, it's definitely uh, uh, a big announcement. Uh, I, I uh, it does remind me a little bit of the 2020 and beginning of 2021, where we had all these really famous names come in and announce <laughs> positions in Bitcoin, and then uh, we got you know retail to jump in on top of it. So we got a lot of new users, but then we couldn't sustain that new level, right? We had to retrench, and and so the question is really here uh, uh, again. Uh, we've seen our community, we've seen them uh, um, basically buy more on the dip, right? They weren't selling, they weren't withdrawing. We oh, just interesting. Them, uh, take loans, buy more Bitcoin, buy more Ethereum, uh, and so on. So so definitely, uh, we knew that this was just a, a very short-term correction. And, uh, but but I'm, I'm concerned about a lot of the people who are leaving crypto because they were liquidated, they went on margin, they thought... We're going to whatever 150,000 or 200,000, and they were sure they mortgaged their homes, and they were sure that this is a, a home run. And uh, unfortunately, that's where people get hurt, they get wrecked, and and uh, the FOMO, in a way, is not always a positive thing for us as a community building long-term uh, broad adoption. So, so I'm just worried about uh, coming out of the show again. I'm super positive. <laughs> I'm, I'm I've been saying that publicly, like if. If you wanna, if you're worried about Bitcoin, you should have been in Miami. You wouldn't be worried at all. But but at the same time, <laughs> uh, over a million accounts got liquidated in the last four weeks. Uh, uh, people who yeah. are long on margin, and most of these people are just not gonna come back to Bitcoin, right? They they burned, they moved on. They're gonna go back and do whatever they did before. Uh, so. Well, that's that's interesting because I thought you and I would end up disagreeing over over that. I've been pretty outspoken about. Uh, Bitcoin and leverage don't mix um, because yeah. of the the fact that this is an 80 vol asset. You've got enough volatility Built that in. adding leverage to it, um, it just, uh, you know, it increases the probability that you're going to get stopped out on a margin call and lose your Bitcoin to your counterparty. And uh, oh, yeah. I like the way Andreas thinks about it. It's, uh, you know, maybe you can get 6% today, but maybe you lose 100% tomorrow. Um, and uh, so, yes, I, I, I so think there, because... There is yeah, go ahead. No, <laughs> no, sorry. Just to that. finish your sentence that you can do it in an aggressive way and you can do it in a safe way. So there are good players in the space and there are bad players in the space. And the bad players are the ones giving you 20x leverage and 50x leverage. In and Celsius, 100 and 125x leverage. Yeah. Exactly. You, don't, you don't do that at Celsius? We, What's the most leverage you'll, you'll offer? We, we only offer 50% LTV. So 0 0.5, right? Leverage. So uh, so, and again, most of our customers are using that to pay credit card and pay their college mm. tuition and, and stuff like that, because, you know, on exchanges, exchanges make money from lending you, uh, putting you on margin, doing all these transactions. We don't sell you any coins. Like you have to get out of the system. You have to go somewhere else. So all the people who are high vol guys, they just trade on Binance or somewhere else. They don't even come to us in the first place. That's mm. why when I'm saying we're a hodler community. Uh, our customers are exactly what you're preaching and we preach exactly the same thing that there is a way to navigate all of this safely without taking excessive risk. And, and again, 90% of our lending is to the institution. The people who pay the interest are the institutions paying us. You know, a lot of the industry participants uh, looking at leverage as one chapter, but really in that there is many, many different variants. I mean, what we do is really sec lending, right? We are the issue of it's just instead of securities we're lending bitcoin and ethereum and, and whatever else is out there so so the the 
uh, let's let's move on a little bit. Just talk about. Uh, well, um, actually, can I follow up? Because uh, yeah, sure, I sure. actually like the debate here. This is really interesting because there was a bit debate in Miami. I don't know if you saw the um, the panel that I uh, was on um, uh, regarding exchanges, and it's interesting because well, Avanti is not an exchange. Me. They forgot to invite. Uh, oh no! Oh no! No! Oh no! Well, um, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried from um, from FTX was was on, and he and I got into a debate. Obviously, FTX is one of the places that does offer high leverage, yes. uh, and we started talking about. Um, and I and I actually I watched, uh, I looked at the, at some of the Twitter comments um, on the panel, and the perception in was mistaken by a couple of people that I'm against leverage. I'm not against leverage. There's a distinction between. Um, if you read Mises, between something called commodity credit and circulation credit. Commodity credit is self-liquidating debt. Leverage that goes up to one-to-one -one is justified because you have a real asset, that commodity, that, 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 um, that, that truly backs that debt. The, the inflation is not debt from a zero threshold. Inflation is debt above a 100% threshold, right. right? And so when you start offering... Um, anything above one-to-one -one leverage, even two-to-one, even three-to-one. And this is where Sam and I got into a debate uh, because he said most of the leverage in this industry um, has been in the, in the, in the three to five times. I think that's what the, the, the level that he quoted, something like that. In other words, we were talking about the hundred-to-one futures contracts. I will tell you this, those have the regulators um, heckles up uh, because um, whether or not they're, they're actively used in the industry, the regulators know that, I mean, if you're operating a book that has 100 to 1 leverage, right, the probability that there's a 1% move um, between now and the time that your futures contract matures is virtually 100%, okay? Yeah. And so what you're, what's going to happen is uh, uh, the 100 to 1 futures contracts are essentially a way for the exchanges to take your Bitcoin, right? They're really not that different from bookies. And when I, when I talked about that on Twitter, somebody challenged me and said, bookies at least, you know, run a two-way book. A one, a, a, you know, 100 to 1 leverage contracts are not running a two-way book. And, and so, I, you know, I, I take their point. The probability of losses on these kinds of things is, is so high. And, um, and I'm not advocating for regulation, but I'm also looking at what's coming and seeing that the regulators are looking at all that and saying, this industry needs to get regulated. And, and so even those that are not using high leverage are going to suffer because of those that are um, offering high leverage, even if they're not actively used. As, as an industry, what I wish we would do is, is have the counterparties disclose a lot more information. So we have the transparency that you're now getting in DeFi. I want to talk to you about that because I know you're moving in DeFi as well. We want counterparty risk um, transparency so we know who our counterparties are and whether they're solvent or not. And then we also want um, transparency on, especially these leverage contracts, what's the loss expectancy? I saw some, someone is disclosing the expected loss on their contracts for difference, which is a, one of the forms of leveraged um, derivative play. And it has a loss expectancy of 76%, right? So um, three quarters of the time that you're trading that contract, you're going to lose your Bitcoin to the exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if we disclosed all that, I have a feeling there would be fewer people um, you know, losing their Bitcoin to the exchange. And, and I, I'm happy to hear that in your but case, also, the leverage that you're offering is not that high. Right, we, we do really margin lending. We don't do leverage, right? I mean, we don't offer any leverage. Uh, yeah. Well, but, margin lending is leverage. <laughs> so oh, but again, yeah. it's up to 50% LTV, like you said. That's our yeah. average total book of loans against the collateral that we have. So 20 billion in collateral, right? We're probably the, the lowest leverage in the entire industry, right? I mean- yeah, that sounds low compared to what I know is out there with others. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but so the, yeah. the, the most DeFi platforms are 75%, like Aave and Compound are 75% LTV. And like you said, most exchanges are 400, 500% and so on. So Well, we don't know. No one no one discloses, right? If they're, if they're offering 100 to 1 and they say, well, very few people use that, you know, what's the right. what's the real amount of leverage out there? We right. don't know. And, and, well, we, and by the way, know, that's one know, of the things. We know what was liquidated. So you know that. Yes. When, so you know that when Bitcoin went from uh, 65 to 30, so you know you can do the math of what was the leverage in the system because you can see the daily volumes and everything else, but, but I, I look, I totally agree with you. We, we have nothing to argue over <laughs> when you run a hodler community, our job number one and job number two and job number three 
is to make sure that our community retains the coins. And uh, we don't have any, you're not gonna find a single Celsian will tell you, Celsius took my coins. Celsius charged me a fee. We don't charge any fees, right? We, we have to earn yield. So the, the model is a beautiful model. Also, again, we mostly lend, 90% of the lending is to institutions. So that's where Binance and some of the other platform fail. They lend mostly or almost entirely to retail. So the, the you know, because try to take coins from institutions, they know how to protect them, right? But, but it's easy to take coins from retail because they don't understand the, like you said, the leverage and all the other points. But so we try to solve this with DeFi, right? I mean, Celsius probably the largest single participant on Aave or Compound or, or the other platform that we're on. We have over 4 billion on DeFi right now, maybe four and a half billion. So deployed on DeFi, right? So, so I think, uh, um, uh, again, the complexity, most, again, 7.8 billion people on the planet. <laughs> yes. How many of them will be able to have the right knowledge and all, know all the steps and get the education to be able to safely transact on DeFi. So I think even though we solved some of this transparency and counterparty stuff that we talked about in the last 20 minutes, uh, the, the, the difficulty of onboarding, of just joining this community and then keeping up with it, right? Is <laughs> right. tremendous, right? It's moving so yeah. fast that even if you're up to speed, guess what? That was yesterday, today is different. So, so the challenge, I think, what at least what we're trying to do at Celsius is really create this uh, safe zone, right? Most platforms are neutral, like Ave, which is our partner, love the platform. Stani's a great guy, but they're neutral. They're not representing the depositor. They're not representing the yield seeker. What, what we've done differently is we basically said, look, we're gonna do everything for the depositor and nothing for the borrowers, right? And we're gonna use, we're gonna use, uh, uh, DeFi platforms, but we're going to basically protect the depositor, automate all the things that they want because they just want yield. They don't want to go on the platform and press buttons or figure out what the rates are or when they should withdraw, when they should deposit. And 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 for ninety percent of the population, maybe ninety nine percent of the population, I think we need to enable these type of bridges to bring them on board because they're not going to be able to keep up with all the tech and the security and knowing which one is the real platform and which one is a rug pool and which one is, you know. <laughs> well, so we've seen it, a couple of them did did have challenges in this most recent correction. They were relatively small ones, but yes, you're right. These are, it's the wild west still. Exactly, it's the wild west, but we did make huge progress like in, in the 2020 uh, uh, flash crash maker, a lot of the other platforms had major liquidity issues. This time we yep. didn't have any, and this was a bigger correction. So I'm very, Right. I was actually very surprised in a positive way that we were so resilient, right? So, so I think the the only platform that did not go down, like Uniswap and others, were all decentralized. All well, exactly, right? yeah. You know, it's right. fascinating. The centralized platforms went down, and, yep. and you know, this the, in this community, uh, there's always naturally skepticism. Uh, we don't necessarily have a high trust factor in this community, and that's by nature how a lot of us got here, especially in the early days. Um, and we didn't come here for speculating on the price, right? We came here because this is really interesting trustless technology, and that has all kinds of applications. But um, so naturally, the, the the instinct of a lot of folks in the community is to is to think that the centralized exchanges went down by design. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's true or not. Of course, I have no direct knowledge of that. Uh, um, it is also safe to say that the volume that was being put through those exchanges, especially when you consider the dollar value of that volume, even if the same number of trades were going through that went through in March, 2020, when, when only a couple of them went down, pretty much all the centralized, the big ones, centralized exchanges went down this time. And it just raises some interesting questions. Is DeFi actually better? I mean, you know, interestingly last night on the, um, uh, on the Twitter um, spaces, I, I was just watching as the number of participants just started to explode over the span of a couple of hours. And uh, I, to be honest, it was kind of, it must've been fun for Jack Dorsey to be on that because he was watching this community, which is new, um, and um, the tech was a little buggy, but it wasn't bad. And it scaled from 1,000 people to 22,000 people in the span of a couple of hours. 
And we really didn't have problems. It was kind of, a, it was, it was great. Now that's a centralized service. But, um, but, you know, the, the, the engineers who think a lot about scaling, um, you know, definitely have a, have, have a better outcome. And it's fascinating, especially in the Coinbase case, there's, you know, Coinbase kind of goes down every time there's a volume spike. Again, the, the folks definitely have in the community raised questions, is this on purpose? And at this point, you know, that company is obviously able to raise money in, in capital markets and has done so now. So why not invest in better scaling architecture. Um, and so I understand why there are questions being asked about the centralized exchanges. Why, why do you go down when um, trading volumes go up? Is it, is it because there are problems? Uh, but I think everybody needs to read the fine print, especially when it comes to um, centralized counterparties, because in a lot of cases, they have the right to, to what's called gate you. We call it in the traditional financial services industry, hedge funds will gate you, um, which means that they have the right to say, you can't have your money back for 30, 60, 90, sometimes 100, or sometimes a full year. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, what's the scenario when they gate you? It's gonna be because they've lost a lot of money and you can't get liquidity. But to your point, Alex, the, the, the DEXs, um, if you could get liquidity and get on the DEXs, you could trade. But if you couldn't get liquidity and couldn't get on the DEXs, then, um, then you were stuck and, and, and you know, missed the bottom. Um, so really interesting dynamics gaps, in the market. The price gaps were over 5%. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, like uh, I was buying Ethereum at 1830 or something like that and Bitcoin at 29,000. And if you were on Coinbase, you couldn't do anything, right? If you were on Binance yeah. APIs, you were, uh, you were down, right? So if you were a bot, <laughs> even bots, computers <laughs> couldn't do anything. But yeah. as a human on a DEX, you could do whatever yeah. you wanted. So, so right. it was definitely the fact that we have choice. Fascinating. Yep. The fact that we have this choice now is an extremely important uh, element because, again, uh, again, at Celsius, what we do is, is we don't care where it is. I mean, we just know what the position is. And if we need to buy, we buy. We, we buy wherever the lowest price is. So if it's on, uh, on a DEX, great. We'll, we'll buy a wrap Bitcoin on a DEX. And for us, it represents the same economic value that we have to deliver uh, to our users, right? So, so it's definitely a different world. And, and again, none of that exists in traditional finance. So oh. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing innovation. When I, when I try to explain to people that this new set of rail is like a different universe in, in, in seven dimension compared to what we're running today, they look at me like, what are you talking about? They're just computers doing the same thing not the same thing, you know, like, so, so maybe you talk about that because you were involved in a lot of parts of that, both with the regulatory side, getting licenses. So where are we heading? Because there's a lot of confusion, especially with the new kind of people in charge in Washington. And, right. Uh, and our community is really worried about, uh, is regulation going to be friendly? Are these people here to slow us down? How are they going to treat this new asset class? Well, I actually think it's better than it could be uh, because it, it seems pretty clear now uh, from the drip, drip, drip of nearly daily news coming out of Washington, D.C. and Beijing started at about the same time. Was that coordinated or not? No one knows. But um, interesting timing uh, that, you know, China wants to uh, wants to wants the crypto miners to be gone every day. It seems like there's something new coming out on that. Um, so you see some of the whale selling. I presume those are whales that uh, that are that are out of China, trying to get ahead of what's happening, um, you know, in in the China market. Uh, and then also in the U.S., it's been drip, 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 drip. Um, but I'm I'm more optimistic because ultimately these things are healthy for us long term. Um, we have a lot of uncertainty in the U.S. about who can do what. And everyone in the industry, everyone, even those that actually have the best types of charters, still have the proverbial sort of Damocles hanging over their head because the Fed has not approved anyone yet. And the Fed is ultimately the, the regulator in the US that, that sits over the US dollar. So every single US dollar ultimately has to clear through the Federal Reserve, whether it's directly through a bank that has a clearing account there and can settle dollars, or whether it's indirectly like a correspondent bank that might, you know, like a Silvergate that services, um, you know, a Coinbase or a Kraken onshore in the United States. Um, those, that's an indirect, uh, indirect exposure, but ultimately the Fed is still in control of that. Every US dollar 
ultimately touches the Federal Reserve. And so that's the agency that, that hasn't yet said anything specific. And, um, and to be honest, uh, the, the fact that there's a sprint team in Washington, D.C. that's now been disclosed, um, that's interagency, and they're all working together, and it, and it includes the Federal Reserve, I think you're going to start to see some policies come out. But the reason why I'm more optimistic is if they wanted to try to ban it, which we all know they couldn't, and I think they know they couldn't, they, they couldn't do that. So um, rightfully, they're trying to think, all right, what do we do next? It's tax it and regulate it. And so if we can get um, clarity on, on the regulatory rails, then I think it'll be easier for the industry to, um, you know, to, 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 to proceed. Um, there's a debate, of course, whether Washington should just be hands off like it was during the, the Internet. Um, and to be honest, um, uh, I think that's not realistic because ultimately we're dealing with money here and money is the most highly regulated thing on the planet. Uh, and so as a result of that, I think the, um, the, the expectation that there won't be regulation is not realistic. There is going to be regulation. And if we can get some clarity on what it's going to look like and who's the, who, who has regulatory jurisdiction over this, um, frankly, it allows the industry to, to move to that, to that next level. There will be disruption, though, and I think stablecoins is one of the places where, rightfully so, a lot of folks are watching. I was talking with one of the institutional traders in Miami, and he said the, he wasn't as worried about what the U.S. was going to do, despite all the questions about you know Tether and USDC. Um, he was less worried about that than he was with what's China going to do, because they want... Uh, in his view, that the the CBDC to take over, yep. and they don't want the U.S. dollar stablecoin to be as ubiquitous or Bitcoin as it is. And as a result of that, um, there he was more worried about a potential crackdown on um, on stablecoins coming out of China. Just some food for thought. I don't have any particular I, I, advice yeah, I, there. I, I totally agree with you. I think the crackdown has to do with clearing the way for the digital yuan. And, and making sure there's no competition there and then extending that to the Silk Road to their initiative with 86 different countries where they're funding infrastructure and everything else. They want all that denominated in digital yuan. So, so this is a, a global, this is yuan versus dollar. We just got stuck in the middle and we're bouncing between the two, you know, but, but I, wanna, I want you to explain because uh, a lot of people read the news and they say, oh, Pax has got uh, fed, our federally mm. chartered bank now. Anchorage is a fairly chartered bank. They can do anything. Can they? Are they <laughs> part of the Fed system? Are they? No. The fact that they can custody Bitcoin. What does it mean? On that the they can side? do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what's the definition of a bank in the United States? A bank is a financial institution that is expressly authorized to take U.S. dollar deposits. That's the critical thing. So um, Anchorage, Paxos, uh, Protego, BitGo, all of those that are applying for the OCC Trust Bank Charter are not banks under that definition. And in order to be eligible to get access to the Fed, you have to be a depository institution. There are a lot more details, but that's the, that's the critical piece right. of it. Exactly. Um, and so getting a trust bank charter definitely helps from a custody perspective, and it preempts all these 50 state um, money transmission licenses that everyone in the industry has been complaining about because it's a patchwork of regulation and it's just more work. Um, but, uh, but the OCC Trust Bank Charter, here's the problem, the other problem. First of all, it, it only solves the custody piece. It doesn't solve the US dollar access piece because the OCC Trust Banks are not eligible to get access to the Fed. But here's the other problem. The OCC Trust Charter was created by a rule change, not by a statutory change. And rules can be reversed. Right. Statutes, I suppose, can be reversed as well, but you've got to go through a congressional process to reverse the statutory change. So ultimately, something, that, something that's more durable is a statutory authority. That's what the Wyoming bank charters are. They're, they're authorized by statute and their depository institutions. The OCC Trust Charter, Charters were authorized pursuant to a rule change and they're not depository institutions. So um, at what came out is the announcement that the new head of the OCC is quote unquote, reviewing everything. Exactly. And, um, and, and, and you know, it's almost like we have to worry that they might reverse it. 
right? Yes, absolutely. You know, they're, they're effectively saying that. It's hard to say whether that will actually happen or whether, or whether Anchorage, um, which was first in line, is, is the most likely to be grandfathered, uh, but it won't get Fed access. And they've said publicly that Fed access is not something that they're interested in. I think the others are interested in it, but um, it'll, be, it'll be fascinating to see. But there is a, there is a cloud over, over those OCC trust charters right now. And, um, and, and to get a little wonky, but this is important, what the OCC did um, under Brian Brooks, the week before the Biden inauguration, right. they changed a longstanding decades long policy at the OCC that required trust companies in order to get that particular trust bank charter, the trust companies had to be fiduciaries. Now, custody is not a fiduciary business. What is, what is a fiduciary? A fiduciary exercises discretion. It's somebody who manages the assets on behalf of a customer. Custody is not asset management. Custody is just a service. You're, you're really, a, you know, you're an agent. You're a third party, yep. just a service provider. You're not a principal who's making decisions about where the assets get invested. That's a fiduciary. A pure custodian is not. And so uh, what the OCC under Brian Brooks did was change that decades long policy to say, we will give trust bank charters to non-fiduciaries and then three days later gave, gave the first charter. The banks are up in arms and I think there's, um, I, honestly, I think they're right. This, this should have gone through a public comment period and it was done right before the, um, the Biden um, inauguration and the banks are attacking it. And if, they, if, those, are, if those charters are not reversed, um, there is a pretty high chance that that ends up in litigation. So there's just going to be a cloud over those charters. What's fascinating is we looked at that as, as, the, as it was coming, uh, because of course we're in the process of applying. We'd already applied for our Fed access a few months before the OCC charter came about. So we looked at it, we had to on behalf of our shareholders, and we quickly concluded that it was, uh, it was not built on a solid foundation and there was a decent chance that it would be reversed. And indeed, that's what's happening. And so we stuck with the Wyoming Charter. It is built on a solid foundation. It is eligible for Fed access. And that's the path we're sticking to. Kraken is in the same boat. And I've said all along, the path to plugging the digital asset industry directly into the Fed is through the state of Wyoming. Uh, we don't know if that's indeed going to be the place um, where it happens, but I'm pretty confident. And, um, and many others will end up coming into Wyoming instead of the opposite. And, and with, you know, it's a one step forward, two step backwards, but with all <laughs> that, we're still, I think, ahead of most other nations. Uh, I was looking at, you know, like Singapore and Australia and, and in the European Union, and they're all struggling with even the basics, right? I mean, uh, so yeah. so I definitely think that us resolving it will will definitely uh, keep the United States in, in the leading position with digital assets. So it's a very important point. It's, you know, it sounds like it's uh, some uh, corner uh, uh, issue and not really the main issue. But like you said, if we cannot clear dollars, uh, then we have nothing, right? We don't build the bridge between absolutely uh, uh, centralized finance and decentralized finance. So, uh, so one more point that I think you can explain better than most. So, um, so a company like Circle or Coinbase, which mints uh, uh, USDC, right? They take a dollar on, the, on deposit, they mint the token one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, we, we, we're starting to see the same thing happening with stocks, right? We're starting to see, again, FTX and Binance and other people offering fractional stock ownership through this mechanism. Are these equal? Are these different? How the regulators view these uh, to, this tokenization? Because we've seen a lot of uh, security tokenization that kind of di didn't go anywhere. And now we yeah. start seeing this new breed so maybe walk us through what uh, what does it look like from a regulatory standpoint? Well, we've uh, with regard to securities, we've already seen some crackdowns. Part of the reason tokenization didn't really take off is because the SEC actually went to the companies that were trying to do it and shut them down. Um, and so I, I think ultimately what is coming is that there will be, again, these regulatory guardrails that are going to be um, defined and companies are going to be able to get registered and do that. But the unregistered ones... The SEC, keep in mind, the SEC, it took them eight years to go after Ripple, okay? Um, that was a long time, but um, technically uh, they have, I believe, five years. And then what will happen is they'll try to negotiate and then just toll the statute of, agree to toll the statute of limitations, which is how they extended it out to eight years in that case. 
But uh, just because something is being done now does not mean the SEC isn't going to come after you in five years. <laughs> okay, so um, th that means they're watching you if there's something that's on the edge. And so um, my, the only piece of advice I'll give in this uh, in this session is make sure you're talking to good lawyers if if you're thinking about starting a business in these areas, um, because uh, you definitely you know unless you want to go to jail, um, you definitely want to make sure you have uh, you, you you have your eyes dotted and T's crossed. Um, uh, well, but let, but let, me, let me ask it uh, also because I, I want to touch on the stable coins. So, yeah, again, the US issuance of stable coins pretty clear, ple done by several companies, no issues. The European mm. Union, especially the the Marie Lagarde, has be, have been very negative and very cautious on on issuing these digital assets against yours. Why do you think this disparity between the two? Well, I wouldn't say that this is clear in the US because remember the Fed has not opined yet and the right. Fed is the one that really matters. So there's a sort of Damocles hanging over everyone in the industry who's operating right now because they don't have permission from the Fed. It's a, it's a, how close that sword is to your head proverbially is, uh, is a function of how, how much legal work you've been doing. But Visa, uh, but, uh, Visa yeah. and others jumping in and accepting USDC. How They're taking they some regulatory risk, yeah. You know, and some people do, right? The hedge funds do that all the time. Um, some people do. It's just a different, a different risk appetite, and it's small. So um, if it's if it's a problem, then uh, then it goes away. But most of the big institutions, the, the, the first thing they're going to wait for is legal clarity. And if you look at the terms and conditions, I, I've said this before. USDC is the best at disclosing terms and conditions, in my opinion. And one of the terms specifically says we're not sure what the legal status of this is. And therefore, we're not sure that transactions involving this are legally enforceable anywhere in the world. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, and and um, I don't mean to single them out because I think they're actually being responsible in warning you about that. So the first thing the big institutions are waiting for is clarity, legal clarity from, from the legal and commercial law. That's coming. That's in the, It's winding its way through state lawmaking processes. And so the good news is that's going to come probably in 2022 or 2023 in the U.S., and then the other thing everybody's waiting for is what's the Fed going to do? You know, um, there is stable coins do present some run risk uh, to the financial system. When it was a $20 billion collateral pool, that's not that much, uh, but it's 90 billion and growing very fast <laughs> um, now. And, and um, especially now that we know that Tether has some pretty illiquid credit assets, we don't know what they are, but they've now disclosed that there's a lot of credit assets in its portfolio. That's not just bank deposits. Um, and so if there's a run, um, no one knows what disruption that's going to cause to credit markets. We just don't know. And I assume the regulators are looking into all that um, as we speak. But if it was all in cash um, at an unlevered bank, which is how, by the way, the New York DFS, um, so Paxos and, um, uh, and, and the coins that it white labels like Binance dollar uh, and then the Gemini dollar, New York DFS actually requires the cash to be in a ring fence segregated account, right? So that's different. The USDC does not. Um, and, and now I noticed actually that, that some of their disclosures uh, recently are that it's in cash and other investments and they haven't disclosed what the other investments are because they're not subject to that New York um, requirement. So I think the Fed, the, the Fed has a big challenge, which is um, also that the, that the cash and high quality liquid assets are, are, a really scarce collateral and they're used in the securities markets to fund the big broker dealers. And so if that collateral suddenly becomes scarce because it's being squirreled away in silos, so-called roach motels, right? Where with, with the stable coins, the collateral goes in and then it never comes back out. Um, in the money markets, when the collateral goes in, it goes into the repo market, it goes right. into other pledged collateral markets, it right? Circulates, yeah. It circulates, but when it goes into stable coin pools, it doesn't circulate. That's a problem. This is the real reason why the central bankers, when Facebook Libra was announced almost two years ago, the central bankers collectively screamed because they understood it was going to have a huge impact on the repo market. So there's no question in my mind, and there's never been any question in my mind that the, that the bigger stable coins become, the greater the likelihood that, that the Fed steps in and says, you know, you have to do X, Y, Z. I don't think they're going to they're gonna shut it down. It's the same same thing as, as with Bitcoin and other cryptos. They're, they're going to tax it and regulate it. How, how is the regulation going to look is, is really the question uh, we don't know the answer to. And uh, do you have to get a bank charter to, to issue these? 
um, in which case everybody would have to then go get a bank charter. Um, that's originally what they told Facebook, as you may recall, two years ago, right. go get a bank charter. Um, so if they, if they bring it all inside the banking system, which Fed Governor Lael Brainerd um, has spoken out pretty, pretty loudly about long, over the long haul, she wants a lot more of the securities industries um, activities inside the banking sector. And she's now starting to talk about stable coins using those same terms. Uh, and uh, she used a term that, uh, that, that central bankers consider uh, to, be, uh, to be toxic, which is she, she called what's happening in stable coins to be analogous to the free banking era. She didn't use the phrase wildcat banking, but if you understand the history, you understand why central bankers don't like that term. Um, and uh, so when she's making reference to that, it's, it's it, you know, she's firing a proverbial warning shot. And then you also saw Jay Powell, the, the Federal Reserve chairman, start talking about it. Anytime it's up to that level of seniority in the central banking community, you know something's coming. Um, and I think actually what they've done is, is give us a lot of warning. So uh, get ready, something may, may be coming. And um, probably is. Uh, we just don't know what. And it looks like they're releasing a paper on this very topic later this summer. So we'll know relatively soon. I, I totally agree with you. I think fragmentation of liquidity is definitely what they're trying to avoid. And, and uh, we are creating ripples and ripples of it by creating the wrapped assets and versions of all this stuff. And uh, uh, so it's definitely a problem. At the same time, again, Treasury likes anything that is dollar denominated. So the more of these assets are circulating in dollar terms and not in yuan or, or yen or euro, uh, it, is, it is good for treasury. So I think hopefully they'll come to a middle ground. I, I totally agree with you. We need to improve the quality of the issuers and, and make sure that they don't uh, do things like use uh, you know commercial paper or whatever the, the the assets that others are using as backup because those we don't know the quality of those assets right. and and you know in the crypto industry uh with stable coins specifically we need to know that those are pegged really pegged to even though the dollar is free floating and is a fiat currency we need to know it's mm -hmm. pegged to that uh under all circumstances so galing thank you so much this has been amazing a lot of learning here and i'm sure our community will appreciate all the details and you've shown your knowledge again and again and been a huge ambassador for the Bitcoin and the crypto community. So I wanna thank you for all your efforts fighting uh, for the future, right? And, and uh, we thank you for coming to the MoIP show. Thank you, it's good to get to know you and I appreciate the invitation to come and join you. We'll see you again soon. That's right. And we'll have you back uh, when uh, we have some of these kind of resolutions either from the Fed or, or from from other uh, um, sources so you can explain to us what actually happened <laughs> and are we in a good place or not.